so Leo, to start with, our uh, main concern uh, to talk to you about is to try to grasp uh, the deeper processes that are going on uh, within the United States and which affect, of course, the whole world. So uh, more or less how global capitalism is being or not reshaped by this inner and deeper processes that are going on within the United States right now or for the last uh, years. So we would like to start with the political, economic and social crisis that is going on right now that we can see in this election. Uh, much has been said and read about the word polarization. I think this is a, an important issue for everybody. So on the one hand, uh, Trumpism, the far right groups, violent groups, militias. On the other hand, you could say the, the other, very other side of the coin, uh, the Sanders campaign, Black Lives Matter movements, etc. So having uh, what we have so far in the election results, how do we evaluate uh, these results in terms of the deeper social processes that are taking place in the United States? What does it mean or what could it mean uh, in the near future for the American political environment in terms of political parties or any uh, change in that, uh, social movements, um, unions, etc.? Uh, do you see what you once called the American domestic social decay and the popular anxieties reflected in these results now. So how to better understand them in, term of, in terms of the deeper processes that are going on in the last years? Well, you know, in the 1930s, I think it was Adorno uh, who said, he who speaks of fascism and does not speak of capitalism should remain silent. And I've been saying for some years now that he who speaks of capitalism in the 21st century and does not speak of fascism should remain silent. It seems to be the case, and obviously you see this in Brazil very clearly, that the longer capitalism continues to exist, the longer that socialists are unable to replace it with something humane and democratic egalitarian, uh, uh, that the likelihood is that fascism will gain more and more ground in a capitalist framework in the 21st century. And that's what you're seeing uh, at the very heart of global capitalism in the United States today. Uh, of course, we've seen tendencies like this not only in Brazil, uh, but in Western Europe, uh, uh, in India, uh, uh, but but uh, it happening in the United States is obviously very significant. And it's very interesting in terms of you putting this in terms of the growth of polarization, that this is happening just in the wake of the world having become capitalist uh, at its core that is in uh, social relations between all human beings, right across the globe uh, by the beginning of the 21st century. For the first time in history, really, uh, you would have to say that the whole world became capitalist. And yet at the same time, inside each of the states that fostered this unanimity uh, of capitalism, uh, this oneness of capitalism around the world, within those states, the polarizations have exploded. Uh, obviously, in terms of class inequalities, uh, built on some decades of uh, the repression of trade unionism, uh, uh, but also, obviously, the changes in the labor force that uh, a global capitalism encouraged, uh, uh, and a continued fragmentation of old working class communities, a deformation of the working class, if you like. Uh, and inside those countries, you not only see the, a growing class polarization in, in wealth and, and income inequality, uh, but you also see 
an explosion of polarizations around identities. Uh, uh, and most visibly in the United States, of course, but not only. Not only because globalization has been accompanied inevitably by a migration crisis around the globe. Uh, and that was felt very strongly in the United States uh, as uh, Central American and Mexican migrants were pulled into the American labor market to do things like water the golf courses of the Trump Corporation. Uh, but at the same time, of course, they were pushed out by the appalling conditions uh, in uh, the countries they came from, whether induced by external war or more likely induced by internal wars. Uh, so you've seen a polarization of identities. In the American case, it, it inevitably takes the form of uh, the legacy of slavery. To some extent, that's true in Brazil uh, and its continuing effects, uh, not least in the terms of the ways it divides the working class. And while Black Lives Matter, for instance, is a very important development in relation to police suppression and very important for calling for a restructuring of the local state apparatus around police, not just changing policy, but actually reorganizing the apparatus. That's very important. But behind this, the leadership of Black Lives Matter is very much an equality of opportunity uh, approach to the inequalities and polarization. You know, it is a upward mobility. There should be as many black CEOs as there are uh, uh, white CEOs proportionate to the population. Uh, and that doesn't resolve the fundamental problem of inequality. So this has created space uh, for the growth, they're not, they're not new, for the growth of these explicitly fascist, racist, xenophobic militias uh, uh, who uh, are very significant on the ground, especially in the current moment. Uh, Trump learned how to speak to them. To some extent, his, his whole persona uh, uh, sometimes always reflected them. Uh, and he has, uh, if anything, increased his support in this election. Certainly, he's increased the number of votes he's got, although the number of total votes went up. Uh, this is very regionally divided. But even in California, or in New York, what is really significant in terms of the fascist threat is that Trump, even there, was getting 35%, is getting 35% of the vote. Imagine that, a third of the population voting for this. Um, so it, it's, it's uh, this, these polarizations are very, very significant. Uh, and there is a distrust of the old ruling class uh, in a very large portion of the population. And the fact that a majority of them or near a majority say that they support Trump uh, on not only a majority, uh, sometimes much more than that, sometimes as much as 75%, on the economy, one has to say, what is that a signifier of? Is it for them that the stock market does well, the economy does well? Uh, is it that before the virus, uh, there was low unemployment in the United States, usually in very shitty and insecure jobs, but still? Um, uh, or, or is it rather that this is a buzzword in a crude way for private property? And that people, what people were really hearing, and certainly in, in Miami, this is what those who escaped leftist governments in Latin America we're hearing. When they hear the economy, they hear private property. They hear their own wealth. And they were astonishingly open to the claim that Joe Biden is a socialist. And, and the most dangerous indication of the growth of fascism is the charge that socialism is a great force in the country. 
and you get therefore a reaction from the anti-socialist forces that Mussolini and Hitler represented so well, if you like, in their own terms, so horribly in our terms. Uh, and, and, you know, the, this raises the stakes. Insofar as the Sanders, well, beginning with Occupy, uh, uh, but then the Sanders campaign pulled so many uh, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of young people into politics, moved them from protests like Occupy to actually trying to get into the state, built a certain infrastructure uh, like the DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America, which, you know, before Sanders had, uh, I think, 5,000 members with an average age, I'm ashamed to say, as old as mine. Uh, it now has 60,000 members with an average age of under 30. Uh, so that's a wonderful thing, and I think it bodes well for the future insofar as those people can turn themselves into organizers into engaging in class formation again with a working class that is so deformed, if you like, that can throw itself into the labor movement uh, in a way that would change the decrepit bureaucratic unions. Not all of them, of course. The teachers, the nurses are a very new and dynamic type of unionism, but most aren't. Uh, and, and that's the sine qua non for building a left which is capable of taking this on. But when it, as it becomes more capable, that does raise the stakes uh, in, in the face of these fascist tendencies. Uh, so uh, this is what we need to be looking for internally uh, in the United States, but obviously not only in the United States, in your own country as well.